so my, my name is Ann Shalom, and we will talk about AC Anywhere and specifically the AWS integration. Um, we talked about this before, but I'm going to try to get a little bit deeper. I was told that you guys wanted to have a little more technical detail, so here we are. So the ACI and your vision is been discussed before, but the idea, it started really with the on-premises ACI offering, APIC, multi-site, so and I'll cover what that is in a second. Then we sort of did a lot of work for the remote location or colo. Um, I'll cover that as well. And then today we'll cover more about the public cloud integration, which specifically the AWS integration, which is the one that's going to be coming, coming out first. Um, so from an ACI perspective, we have this, this capability that's been around for a couple of years now called ACI Multipod. The idea is you build a pod of ACI, a spine leaf architecture, and it's controlled by an APIC cluster. That APIC cluster <laughs> Uh, sees the fabric as a single entity, basically. It's got a it's directly based approach. Now, we can, for a long time now, been able to split that, that, that fabric, so long as you had an IP network between it, and, and manage it with one AP, APIC cluster, so it was one fabric from a management perspective, and we stitched it together with the excellent for you, right? So IP network between multiple pods, and then we, we manage a single ACI fabric. The important thing here is that you, you have a single APIC cluster. There's also some, some requirements here. Because it's a single APIC cluster and we use a sharded database across the APICs, we had a 50 millisecond latency round trip timer requirement because we expect you to split the APICs between sites. So we want to keep that sharded database um, in sync. But a year and a half ago, we shipped something called ACI Multisite. With ACI Multisite, we, we can stitch those multi-pods or single pods of, of ACI together with an IP network. Each site has its own APIC cluster. So it's, it's a more um, resilient design from a management plane perspective. And it also has a multi-site orchestrator that manages all the sites and, and can deploy policy to multiple locations. With multi-site, we have no distance limitations, um, and some of the use cases are a little bit different. But I mean, you guys all know about this. I'm just sort of covering this quite quickly. The important thing to understand is that in, with, with a site location from an MSO perspective, multi-site orchestrator perspective, an APIC cluster is a site. If there is a multi-pod environment underneath it, it's still considered a single site. So it's effectively, it's multi-APIC. It's multi-APIC controlled by a multi-site orchestrator that deploys the policy across it. Um, so we can stretch subnets if we want to. Obviously, the policy gets stretched across as, as required. And the multi-site <laughs> orchestrator is just the provisioning engine and... It's a little more than a provisioning engine. I'll probably cover that in, in, in more detail. Mm -hmm. Today, it's, it's a 3VM cluster. Mm -hmm. Uh, again, 3 VMs for the obvious reason. Um, there are more things that the multi-site orchestrator does, and maybe as we go through, we'll, we'll cover them. Um, <clears throat> the other thing we've been shipping is something called the ACI Remote Physical Leaf. So what this does basically is, so long as there's an IP network between your spines and where your physical leaves are on a different location, they will appear like they're physically connected directly into your ACI cluster. So from a management perspective, this is just extending the cluster to a different location or even on-prem if you want to connect it to a pair of 7Ks that don't speak ACI. So the bottom line is so long as there's IP, an IP connection between them and I can get the HCP between the remote leafs and my APIC so I get all the information to connect back, I can extend my APIC cluster to Today, up to 32 different locations of a pair of remote leaves. It's growing to 64 in the next version of code. So remote leaves have to be in pairs? They don't have to be in pairs, but most people would want to deploy them in pairs. Yeah. Right. Uh, you can use, as you said, this <clears throat> trick within the same data center if you have to span ACI across non-ACI infrastructure. Right. So if you want to, we have customers that have done that so they can expand their, their ACI policy into a different pod of mm -hmm. what I'll call legacy networks, yeah. and then they can connect in and apply the entire policy mm -hmm. back. 
So long again, this is the XLAN across an IP network. The neat thing about this is you don't need the spines out wherever this is, right? And you don't need the AP cluster. So there's some savings involved with that. Colos are a great location. SPs are putting them out in colos as well. So they have a single management domain. But there is no encryption <coughs> here. So running this over the internet is not the best idea. It, so in our upcoming code, we're gonna enable CloudSec on these boxes. So if you have an mm -hmm. FX or later leaf, we can enable CloudSec for the connectivity. It's not done yet. I hid the, the slide that has the roadmap for this because I sort of covered it before. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so there will be CloudSec, assuming you have the right kind of hardware, would encrypt it for you automatically and use okay. APIC for MK, MK, MKEA and all mm -hmm. that stuff. Um, on top of that, we also are shipping in a limited availability something called a VPod. So a VPod is a, is a virtual APIC cluster. We'll just leave it at that. What we do is we deploy two virtual spines, two virtual leaves. They are deployed on, on an ESXi hypervisor today, so they're OVAs. And they have the same functions as you would have them on-prem. So the idea is we extend that capability off to your colo where you have access to the hypervisor, right? So Bluemix, for example, would be a good place. So if you have an ESXi hypervisor today, other hypervisors later, the way this would work is when we deploy an AVE, which I didn't cover, but it's an, it's, it's an ACI virtual edge. Mm -hmm. It sits on a host. It does the ACI forwarding for you. The way that always worked is there was an opflex channel between the AVE and your top of rack switch. And that sort of programmed the programs the forwarding and all the policy and all that stuff and gets all the MAC address information and so forth. Well, there's no physical tour here. So what we do is we deploy two virtual spines, two virtual leaves. The virtual leaves now take that opflex channel for all the hosts in this location and then they can forward, they can create <coughs> basically mini ACI fabric on software only. Ah, so you need those four VMs just to emulate the ACI functionality, and you still need the AVEs in the hypervisor to do the actual switch. That, yeah, the AVEs are the actual data plane, right? Yeah. This is control plane only. So the idea is we didn't want to build a brand new model with Coop and all the other things that we have, all the goodness we already have in ACI. So we, we put them into virtual machines, mm. and we deploy them. So you just deploy four virtual machines because it's simpler to implement than to do you the new stuff. You don't have to change the code. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and you would deploy this as multi-pod deployment or multi-site deployment. This is deployment. considered multi-pod. But you Again, could theoretically APIC, do multi-site, right? Well, yeah, but what, what would the APIC connect to right here? We, don't, we have a virtual APIC, but okay. yes, Got theoretically the we could. Yes. Got the message. Don't. All right. So that was a very quick kind of... Refresher, so <coughs> bottom line is, we have already covered ACI on-prem. We have been shipping the, the ACI multipod and all the edge stuff, all the software. We have the remote leaf, we have the virtual ACI and VPod. So that's been shipping for a while. And what we really came to cover today was the new stuff, which is the, the multi-cloud, really the AWS extension from, AW, from, from your on-prem data center. Um, the important thing I want to cover here is that for all of this, MSO is going to do, be the orchestrator, right? So if you, as you add multi-sites and you add the AWS integration and then later the Azure that's been already announced today and then all the other clouds, MSO will be the orchestrator just if for a multi-site environment. Does that make sense? So Amazon is site. Amazon deploys a cloud APIC. Mm -hmm. Everywhere we okay. have an APIC so cluster, it becomes a site, yeah. right? So we're trying to keep the semantics of how we do forwarding the same wherever you are to simplify that, well, for us and for you when you do your troubleshooting, right? So let me spend a little time on Cloud APIC and what it is. <clears throat> and sort of the other thing I needed to, to kind of go into is from, from, a, from an availability perspective, the ACI hybrid cloud deployment model for AWS comes out <clears> in <throat> Q2 of this year. The Azure integration, which was, I think, demoed earlier today, comes out in Q3. 
Another important point is we have a bunch of customers already using early field trials for AWS. So this is existing code now in customer hands. Why are you doing this for NSX? What, from what integration perspective for NSX? Well, you see, effectively, if I understood correctly before, APIC is just the control plane and you're using the native data plane of AWS or Azure mm -hmm. or Google Cloud mm -hmm. or NSX. So, uh, <laughs> as you know, I, I, I can probably spend an hour just on that. <laughs> let's move on. <laughs> let's move on. But let, let's, let's talk about this and maybe if you want to talk about it offline, I'll, I'll spend some time with you about it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So the cloud APIC is really a form for a, a virtual form factor deployment of APIC. Um, it basically translates the policy from MSO into crowd, cloud constructs. So the important thing here is when we do all of this, there's no agents involved for your instances. There is no, no magic. We basically will use the, the native, in this case, AWS constructs. So theoretically, if you threw the cloud APIC out and you didn't like it anymore, you could resume running your AWS <coughs> infra the way you always ran it, right? So is this just the orchestration engine? It is. It's the orchestration engine. It automates all the deployment. It creates an northbound REST API. I will probably spend all the time on it. It, will, it has its own UI, just like you would if you were deploying mm -hmm a single site of, of cloud, of, of ACI. Yeah, Today, it still requires that you have an on-prem physical presence of ACI. But in theory, once you configure the cloud network, you could turn it off and in turn it theory, on. In theory, yes. Yeah. We probably wouldn't want you to. That's a different story, but in yes. theory, you could, and then you would turn it on when you need to reconfigure the cloud. You're going to miss a lot. So let me let me cover some more stuff. You you you'll be losing a lot of the functionality, and I'll, and I'll show okay. you why. So when you deploy Cloud APIC, you basically deploy it from an AWS uh, <coughs> marketplace, but you fill out a form and you give it the VPC name, the username, the password. It's it's really a two-screen form. It's got a private IP address on it. It's going to have a public IP address on it. Mm -hmm. A few usually you will. Basically, you will fill out a two-page form. When that's done, the Cloud APIC will be deployed, and I'll go through the depth of, in depth of how that happens, but we'll also consume a bunch of, multi, of, of cloud native services. And this is sort of the thing that, you're, that I, was, I was alluding to earlier. You will take the AWS config, the notification services, and a bunch of other things for a good reason, and you'll see why in a sec. Mm -hmm. So the bring up. I, I was told that you guys wanted to do technical, so we'll do step by step on how this darn thing works. Uh, can I yes, just ask just one more question? Mm -hmm. do, you, do you run it in a cluster or do you run it as one VM? So we actually just changed that to a one VM thing. Okay. We have it written as a cluster. So what we are finding is that if we were to lose the VM today, we could get all the semantics and all the configuration information back from AWS. Mm -hmm. So building a cluster, which is how we built it originally, seems to be adding a little extra complexity that you, you don't need. Um, but <clears throat> in EFT, we'll figure out for sure if that's resilient enough. Okay. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So the software was built for clustering, mm -hmm. but we're, we're right now, so actually I changed all my slides to show a single aping instead of a cluster of three um, because of, of that specific reason. So. You're going to do all the parameters like we were talking about earlier. The cloud automation tool does the following tasks. It creates an infra VPC for you in your AWS region that you've told us to create it on. It configures an IGW, so an internet gateway for that VPC. It will configure the route table for the infra VPC. So the routing table, the, the, the AWS router will get configured automatically. We'll configure a security group that will allow SSH and HTTPS for a specific VM or instance. We're going to create the subnets for the VPC that you told us to create. And then we're going to deploy the cloud APIC. We'll attach the cloud APIC to that security group so that now it's ready to, for you to SSH into it mm -hmm. or HTTP into it, HTTPS really. So we're going to all, you're going to fill out that form, and all of this will get done automatically for you. 
Exactly. So the assumption is that the path back home is through the internet. Yes, for this specific for this specific implementation. Yes, direct connect for the for to code. Okay. And then the public IP address is associated with the cloud APIC, right? Uh, elastic we, IP? Is it elastic IP or dynamic IP? So is it, is it fixed or, or dynamic? You can choose. Okay. Perfect. Um, <clears throat> so now the cloud APIC is up. The admin logs into the cloud APIC UI. You register it to MSO. The cloud APIC, you will tell you will go into the cloud APIC and, and give the IP address basically of your on-prem data center, right? So we're going to connect back, we're gonna stitch back to the on-prem data center. The cloud APIC will, will go into the Amazon marketplace, deploy a couple of CSRs. It will configure the CSRs for an underlay connectivity to on-prem. Basically it will create an IPsec tunnel. So you're not using the VPN gateway of Amazon, you're using CSR. No, we're not, we're using the CSR for that, right. So there's multiple reasons for that and you'll see it in a second. So what's going to happen is once the VPN, once the IPsec is up, MSO is going to configure the BGP eVPN control plane for the CSR and connect it back to on-prem. So just like you would do with multi-site, all that things, that same semantics work the way they did for multi-site, right? Same control plane, the VXLAN tunnel gets created, same data plane. Oh, so you have VXLAN over <clears throat> IPsec. Yes. It's, it's an amazing MTU hog. <laughs> We've all been there. <laughs> you know, we love MTUs. The more you give us, the better. So that, that's, that's, that's the semantics of that ride. So we will do that. And then the other thing that Cloud APIC will do at this point is it's going to start <coughs> subscribing to all those config services. And there's a reason for that, and I'll cover it in, in more depth. But basically, the idea is, is this infra VPC becomes an overlay VPC that we use inside ACI, right, mm -hmm. for multi-site orchestration. MSO continues doing the exact same thing it did. Now, the, the technically, <laughs> not quite yet, we have stitched together your, 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 your data center and your, um, assuming you configured the crypto tunnel on, on your data center side, right? So that's the semantics, so just a little bit more. Again, IPsec VPN connection first, BGP, MP BGP VPN second, then a VXLAN tunnel across. So that's the infra VPC. What do you do with the user VPCs, right? So we're actually, the, you're going to be running your, your instances. So we, we give the VPC details to Cloud APIC. Based on that, that, that the Cloud APIC will deploy a VGW. So the, we, we decided not to go to a CSR here because that was sort of a VGW or CSR. We decided to go with VGW only. And we're going, going to configure VGW for each user interface. I'm sorry, each, each user VPC. And then we're going to configure an IPsec tunnel between that VGW and your infra VPC. Basically, we're creating a, spine, a, a spoke infrastructure, right? So we're using that infra VPC as your spoke. Oh, you're sorry, your, your hub for your spokes. Speaking is hard. The AWS subnet router gets updated, right? So the reality of it is that when you deploy an AWS instance, you do not have a <coughs> choice to change your default gateway. The default mm -hmm. gateway is always the AWS router. But what we do here is, hey, you can update the AWS router to make the VGW your next hop for everything or some things, right? So this sort of creates that hub spoke environment for you. I went for this fairly quickly. I cannot tell you how hard this is to do on the AWS console. I've done this by hand. It's not an easy thing to do this. There's and, a reason we automate this. <laughs> right. And so literally, all you have to do is to give the VPC semantics, and this will just be automatic for you. We have customers that have 40, 50 VPCs. Right? This is not an easy thing to do. If you, anyway, so the other thing that Cloud APIC does is it's got a policy, a, a security policy model that, that it goes with cloud. So I've spent a little time on this on the last time, but we sort of 
take the, again, the semantics of on-prem ACI and we bring them to cloud. So basically a VPC subnet is a BD subnet, a network access list is a taboo contract, security group is a contract or a filter. So we do that, that translation for you automatically. So we use the same, the, the, con, the, the, the things that AWS has, has natively to emulate what you would have on-prem. Mm -hmm. And then of course there's more things, you guys will get the slides. The important thing is the infra VPC is the overlay one VRF for ACI, so that's sort of the VRF that we create for that um, VXLENI tunnel. Um, just for your information, this is how we will do it in Azure, right? Same thing, different names. <clears throat> so how does this work? When a person brings up, so a dev brings up a, an instance on AWS, the AWS config services that we're subscribed to will tell Cloud APIC, hey, an instance came up and one of the VPCs you're interested in. Now, the behavior today is, we're, this is another thing we're just discussing with customers in EFT is, hey, we wanna just quarantine that instance unless you tag it appropriately to get the right security model. So the default behavior <coughs> as of right now is, if we don't know what that, that instance is, is and you didn't give me the, an appropriate tag or tell me where it's supposed to go, by default, I'm gonna quarantine it. So you put it into a security group with no permissions. Yes, yeah. or technically some permissions maybe for, for your security, um, you will pick the quarantine group. Okay. Hopefully, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> but the bottom line is, I can't just bring up an instance and connect it back to my home on-prem database. Right? That would not be great. Um, Based on your EPG, that, that so, so basically what's going to happen now is, we assume 99% of people are going to use tags, right? We can do the IP addresses in, in AWS, but frankly, tags just make sense for devs. So the, based on your tag, or the group of tags, there's an end or um, bot process that goes through a, a, a Cloud APIC, we're going to put it in the right what we call cloud EPG, and because of that cloud EPG, you're going to get the correct security policy. So, so yes, it goes from tag that is assigned by whoever creates the VM, mm -hmm. tag is mapped to cloud APIC EPG, right. which is mapped to AWS security group, which is then applied to the, to the VM NIC. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Nice. Yeah. And so again, the, the reality is you can tag them or IP address them. The point is that it can be very, very, very <coughs> granular, right? So you can be in the same subnet, you can be across US East and US West. So if the tag is applied and we have that VPC as a VPC of interest, we're going to apply the right security policy to it. <coughs> we don't care about IP addressing, right? We just care about the tag. We never cared about IP addressing in ACI either. How do you make security groups work across multiple VPCs without using VPC peering? The VPC peering is happening. I know, it's not peering technically. Right, so, so the VPC peering is actually happening from a routing perspective or from no, no, a- No, from a security perspective. Th that happens in Cloud APIC. So you map the IP addresses of VMs on one end into the endpoints of the security group on the other end. We map the instance that mm -hmm. we got the name for from um, the AWS config service mm -hmm. to the right security group. We don't care about the IP address. No, but that works great mm -hmm. within one VPC. Mm -hmm. How can you do that across multiple VPCs? Same tag across multiple VPCs, right? So the same security group goes there. Am I, am I missing your question? Well, maybe I'm missing something because I thought that a security security group, one security group, cannot span multiple VPCs. Oh no, no, yeah. So we'll create it per VPC. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I, yes, it will be per VPC and a per zone. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're, it's smart enough to understand that where you are and, and that you have to create that same policy across multiple VPCs. Yes. Like I said, people have 30, 40 VPCs. This is not a mm -hmm. new problem. Yeah. Sorry. All right, so what, basically that, what that basically means is from multi-site orchestrator, if I push down a policy, <coughs> forwarding and or security policy, it's going to get rendered correctly in the right place, right? So the same policy 
web app DB is going to get rendered if you pick those as your sites correctly. <coughs> and of course, the, the forwarding extension is going to happen automatically as well. So we're not extending L2 into the cloud, so please let's not go down that conversation, okay? <laughs> but the routing mm -hmm. back and forth will happen automatically. Uh, so you are announcing the right subnets into the right VPCs. Right. So we do that now with multi-site, right? If we mm -hmm. have a multi-site and you have a, an endpoint on one site that has a contract to another site, we actually create a shadow network on the first site to apply the contract incoming. Mm -hmm. Same thing happens with multi, another way of multi-site, right? And again, another reason to have the, the CSRs. Mm -hmm. And of course, this will work across multiple clouds by Q3. So how do we pull it all together? Because I want to I wanna get to the interesting part. So the routing is, is fairly, the forwarding, routing is a different word, right? It's fairly simple, right? The, the, the spine and will, will have all the forwarding semantics from, from the CSR. Again, from a forwarding perspective, this is almost like another site in multi-site except we don't extend L2, right? And so the forwarding will just happen across that tunnel. We're also looking at adding multiple tunnels for HA and not for HA, for, but for, for uh, bandwidth that's not done yet. So right now it's one tunnel. Um, not a whole lot of interesting things here. The things that have to be accepted is, hey, the security has to permit that traffic both ways and then the forwarding happens automatically. Mm -hmm. Creating an application in MSO is fairly simple, right? It's just drag and drop. The neat thing about it is that if I create something that says, okay, on-prem, I'm going to allow web to app, on your instances within, AW, within AWS, we're going to permit that. So if it's within the same VPC, we're just going to permit set security group to permit that traffic. So I have a web and an app instance in the same VPC. That's a security group change, right? Mm -hmm. The forwarding happens right within AWS normally. Now, what if I have it across two VPCs? Then not only will I set the security group right, but I will also set the forwarding correctly for this to happen back and forth. So if I have web on VPC one, app on VPC two, I will set the security groups on both VPCs to permit the contract, and I will also create the forwarding semantics for this to happen. So will you propagate the subnets or the host <coughs> routes of the VMs that should talk to each host other? Host routes right now. Good. You can't do the subnet because there could be 10 VPs, 10 EPGs in, in a I know. subnet. That's yeah. why I asked. Another reason to do <laughs> CSR. Yeah. And again, this is IPsec tunnels inside, right? So that's the hub spoke requirements. So why does it matter? Why does it matter? Have you guys done this? This is the routing table for two subnets on a single VPC. That's what it looks like. I'm not trying to be down on AWS. But this is hard to do. <laughs> well, this is why people use Terraform. Uh, and, and or other tools, yeah. right? The problem is that doing this even in Terraform, when you get a hub spoke environment, say 20 VPCs, that Terraform form becomes complex, right? So if I do this for you automatically and on the fly, okay, I just create a new contract for the new instances and now I did the forwarding automatically for you, I may be saving you a lot of time and money. The other thing that's neat is that if you do something that, that we call service graph, this is a futures thing in AWS, but we can do this for you. Oops, sorry. Can I do this for you? I can do this for you. You could deploy, again, this is a futures conversation for us, but we could deploy a services VPC so you can drag traffic between <clears throat> endpoint groups for a firewall if needed. Yes, sir. Between VPCs, not within VPC, if, right? Yeah. <laughs> you can't, so this is, uh, I did point it out the right way, yeah. Mm -hmm. But even this, 
in AWS is an incredibly difficult thing to do. Oh right? yeah. So deploying your own virtual firewall in AWS, and the only way to do it as far as we know right now is to create a service VPC, mm -hmm. and then you have to configure your, your routes between them and make sure that the route between EP, VPC one coming from a specific endpoint instance go, is routed to the service VPC. And it, but for us, this should be a fairly simple thing to stitch together. Yeah, well, the problem in AWS <coughs> is that they don't do PBR. It, and and, this and is, you can do PBR on the PBR. CSR, yeah. yeah. <laughs> One question, what yes, kind sir. of firewall do you support here? Anything you want. Can, can be anything, yeah? Yeah. The, we're just doing the forwarding, right? The firewall is, is up to you. Okay. They do PBR. We pass it to your firewall, you tell me. So in, in, in MSO, it basically says, hey, I want to consume this firewall. That firewall sits there and we'll stitch it together for you. We do it in ACI and, and on-prem. Because we are using PBR can be part specific, what I would like to redirect to that one. Yeah. Exactly, it, it's, it's basically host routing per, for PBR, right? <clears throat> because again, this subnet could have 10 different types of what we call endpoints, endpoint groups. So we have to do it by host. Mm. Yeah, effectively you turn your ACI contract into PBR rules, into route maps, into CSRs. Right, well, <laughs> well, basically the way it works is you attach a service graph, a PBR, right, in this case, to a contract. That's how we do mm -hmm. service graphs inside ACI, right? So we say traffic between two sets of groups has to go for this firewall, and in ACI it could be, and this load balancer, and then this firewall, and then the IDS, and we can stitch them together. In AWS that gets really complex. <laughs> Is that shipping or is that future? Futures, that's a future thing, the, the PBR thing. Mm -hmm. That's not gonna come in the first version of code. Mm -hmm. So the other thing that, that, the other reason to have this installation and this integration and the reason to keep the cloud APIC running is that we take all those cloud native events, we take all the information from your CSRs and we aggregate them and make them APIC language is the best way of Consumable. putting it. Consumable consumable from a single point of management, which is going to be the MSO. So that was another use case, again, not yet. <coughs> this is done, this is going to be done first. The place we're going to consume it in the future is going to be MSO. So the idea is taking all the stuff that, that comes in 20 different formats, that you would probably have four different tools to try to, to aggregate, and at least make it red light, green light for you, right, is a useful tool and we're going to do that by consuming it, sort of munging it, deduping it, and sending it out to MSO in, in, a, in what we call an APIC format. Does that make sense? So because we also are <coughs> using, because we're, we're going to be using um, native integrations with AWS, the, the cloud native services stay the same. So if, you, if you're going to go to the internet, so long as the security policy allows it, you're just gonna take the regular IGW out. So we're not doing anything special for that. We're only doing special stuff coming home. So regular internet access, so long as your security policy is permitting it, take the regular path. And it goes straight from the user VPC out. Well, depends on how the user is set up, right? We can have an IGW on the user VPC. Mm -hmm. You can have an IGW on an infra VPC the semantics can be different, right? But I can also stitch for outbound traffic, a firewall in between, yeah? Yes, you could. Not yet in the future, right? So because from that, for us, that's an L3 out from an ACI perspective. So we could do that not yet, though. Okay. But bottom line of this is that we don't get in the way of your regular AWS integration. If you've got an elastic load balancing integration, so long as the security policy permits it, we'll let AWS handle that in their own way, right? There's no need for us to do anything special there. And all, same thing with S3 integration, right? <clears throat> if you need S3 integration, assuming the security policy permits it, we're just gonna let AWS handle that as well. So uh, we're trying not to make it too complicated. Point was, if, we, if we're not there and the stuff is running, it should continue running. Who is configuring the private link to S3 bucket? Right now you are. Okay. 
right now. Sure. What we are doing, we seem, it seems to be different groups doing this right now. Mm -hmm. It's not that we couldn't, we left it alone. We sort of said, okay, well, that stuff is done by the dev team. Let's not get involved in that, except for permit deny, permitting it, the traffic or not, mm -hmm. right? Um, if you think there's a good, good use case for us to do it in APIC, oh. you can do that as well. Again, we're trying to sort of fall into how the, the, the actual admins would use this, right? Generally speaking, the, the dev guys, they want to spin up their instance and they want to just talk, right? They, they're usually not the guys that think about doing the, all the forwarding information or the security, frankly. Um, this will also give you sort of a single point of visibility, at least for your security policy that shows my instances that are tagged web are not talking to DB, they're talking only to app. At least you can at least check that, which is very difficult to do right now. Um, quick thing on roadmap. Um, Direct Connect is coming in 4.2, so 4.1 <clears throat> is coming very soon. It's already in EFT. Direct Connect, again, the, what we've seen is customers want to try it. They don't want to pay for Direct Connect just to try the service. So we're, we're letting them kind of trial and, and get, get comfortable with it first. So it, it made more sense to us to do IPsec over the internet right now. Um, All right, that's just animation. The next thing is AWS just announced their TGW, the transit gateway, in, in the latest, uh, was it in their latest conference? And so in 4.2, we're going to let you use the TGW <coughs> to stitch things together. You're going to get better throughput, right, than you're going to get from a VGW or CSR. So we're, we'll do the configuration for you, but when I get, we're well, going to get out of the way of VGW and the IPsec requirements. So this is a new functionality that they already have. That, actually, it's already prod. Mm -hmm. They already have in AWS. In 4.2, we're going to start taking advantage of that if you want to do that. But you would lose, for example, the service insertion capability. With this, you'd lose the service insertion yeah. capabilities, yes. It's not as, as feature rich as you would be. I, again, theoretically, we could still stitch it together with the CSRs, but it would be complex, right? I mean, there are use cases for everything. <coughs> you don't have to go this way. It seems to be a more user-friendly, better throughput, less cost way of doing things to interconnect your, your VPCs. But configuring it is complicated still. So from 4.1 release, CSR interconnect automation, uh, public operations, ALB support, four cloud sites and four physical sites is the, what we're going to QA. 4.2, we get Azure, we get more of the day two operations, which is basically getting all the, all the logs in MSO. Um, we're going to go to six sites, the transit gateway, direct connect, all the things we're talking about. Um, this is pretty much under commit review right now. All the other stuff is coming in the future, but uh, you can see how SD1 interconnect and things like that are going to get covered by our, our friends after me. Um, quick thing, there's a live demo of this in the world of solutions. I will show you what it is. If you can go there, I, I was going to do a live demo here and then I said, you know, I got 45 minutes and I'm just worried that that's not gonna work out. So what we have there is literally this inf integration, right? We have a CSR 1KV in, in, in Infra VPC. I, I believe it's uh, America US West 1. We have our lab set up for another CSR. We have deployed a database on-prem, <coughs> database, and we have a web server uh, at an AWS, and basically what we have is this stitched together. In the demo, what they usually do is they'll just, they'll show you that this works, so you can get to the web server and you get info from the database. They literally will just delete the contract and you will stop working. You can go into the AWS, and in, you're going to go into the AWS and you're going to see that the contract is gone, that the rule is gone from the contract, and then they're gonna add the contract back and it's gonna push it back and security, it will just work. I think it's a pretty neat, um, it's a pretty neat demo. It's very quick and you can see it ha just working in the real world. Um, so my, my summary, because I ha apparently everybody has to have a summary, is that it, it, it seems like I have to do a summary. 
so my summary really is that ACI Anywhere, the, the vision is now a reality for us. I, I mean, it's, it's pr pretty much all deployed and working today. Um, and that's all I had. I finished in time. I, I, did I, did I, I? Just a quick question. I know yes, we're running out of time, but just the end <laughs> goals like the multi-cloud approach that for you, when you have all configured and set up, it is invisible if you deploy something in Azure, AWS, or stitch together across the ACI fabric, yeah? Yes, and, and, and consistent policy as well, which is very difficult to do. So you can use the same tags, same... Right, uh, same security. So in other words, if I have a web server in Azure and a web server in, in AWS and eventually Google Cloud, it, it should only be able to talk to app servers no matter where it is, right? So it's sort of having that consistent policy and also the consistent visibility, right? So if I can take the, the, all those cloud logs and aggregate them to something that makes sense to you, it makes your life a lot easier, right? Even if I can just give a red, white, a red green light, right? It would be a lot easier. <laughs>